Spanish is, I think, one of the top languages when it comes to content creation worldwide. Uh, if we would put the statistics, not only in video game content, but also in entertainment content, sports, all that stuff, and add it up, we would probably be uh, number one when it comes to content, you know, exported all over the world. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Craft Podcast. Today uh, we have a special guest, Luisa Fernandez, head of gaming video Latin America at Meta. Uh, how are you doing today, Luisa? Hi, Don. I'm doing fine. How are you? I I'm great. You know, just uh, morning here, and the weather is beautiful as always in Southern California. Um, and, and where are you where are you right now? I'm in Mexico City. The weather is beautiful here all year long as well. Wow. So you okay. can visit anytime. Well, I'll definitely have some questions about Mexico City later, but let's start off with um, what is your craft? Ah, that's a good question. My craft would be leading entertainment companies and brands in Latin America. And great. And can you share uh, some of these brands or some of your story of, of what you've been uh, you know, launching in Latin America? Sure. Um, I started my career in the film industry, uh, which lasted just a few years. I did one movie called um, I Volunteer. It was a volunteer job doing uh, Buffalo de la Noche with Guillermo Arriaga. And uh, after that, I went into the toy business, managing the, uh, the girls part of Mattel, Barbie, my scene, Polly Pocket. And then I entered the gaming industry and I've been there for 18 years managing brands, launching brands like Bandai Namco, Sega, uh, Bethesda in the region as well. I was part of uh, Microsoft launching Xbox One and all the games that were involved in, in Xbox One like Rise and the Rise, Dead Rising 3. Also, I was able to launch Capcom here and then I moved into Blizzard, uh, managing all the different franchises in Latin America. And uh, I did some time in the casino business and the telco, uh, working uh, for Huawei, and then joined Meta, that it's been one year and 10 months, almost, managing the gaming video business. That's awesome. Well, let's talk about um, just like Latin America for a second, because I feel like people aren't talking about it enough. Um, you know, when I look at some of the other entertainment brands, like the streaming services, like HBO Max and, and Disney Plus, they've already launched in Latin America. But as part of their roadmaps, they are like kind of prioritizing Latin America as a first region they're uh, launching into. Like, why is that? What What is so exciting about Latin America? Is it like population growth? Is it like young people, um, young audiences? So like, why are all these entertainment companies prioritizing Latin America to, to be launched in first? Um, that's a good question, John. I think part of the of, of, of the success in Latin America for the entertainment companies is the younger audiences. You know, like uh, you know, Latin America has a very a very important like younger adults base when it comes to like comparisons with Europe or APAC, big families. I don't know if it's called growth birth, the birth growth, or it's very it's it's heavily in Latin. So younger audiences keep coming generation over generation versus other regions. I think that's an important part of, of why entertainment companies, they, they get a lot of lap time. I think our, you know, PIF or GDP in this case in English, it's, it's, it's growing, you know, in the different countries like Mexico, uh, Brazil, Argentina, Chile. I think also the loyalty base. I think uh, that's kind of like a cultural thing. People are very loyal to, to, to a lot of brands. And also I think if you took, like if you compare your, ourselves with uh, North America, it's like we are a little behind, right? It's like between five to 10 years uh, behind you guys. So uh, uh, something that was very successful five years ago to 10 years ago, it's still very successful with us, right? So that's also giving them a little bit of more lifetime to consoles, to now streaming platforms, 
everything. I think that's part of also why LATAM is still very relevant for a lot of companies. So, you know, one thing that people who don't work on international businesses think about is you always hear terms thrown around like Northern America, LATAM, APAC, or like EMEA, but, you know, like, like what is LATAM? Like how many countries are we talking about? And when you're delivering an experience, is there really just like a uniform for everyone or do you have to go in certain cases, country by country just to be successful? Oh, good. I mean, Latin America is, it's, it's actually made out of 33 countries. From those 33 countries, 20 of them are Spanish speakers, one Portuguese, that it's Brazil, and the French, well, you know, that it's, uh, you know, they speak French and we have one speaking Dutch that it's Suriname. So pretty much that's how it's around. I mean, so we have some other countries that are English speakers, right? Uh, included, these countries include the Caribbean, right? Latin America, it's, you know, all this based and plus the Caribbean, right? All the islands. The content, I mean, a lot of the Caribbean islands are Spanish speakers and English speakers, right? So the content or whatever you want to launch, yes, it needs to be different. Like, let's say from the Spanish speaking countries to Brazil, since they are like the main markets, right? If, if, we, if we put Latin America as business wise, you would divide it into sub regions. That is Brazil and the Spanish speaking Latin. Got it. And, you know, another thing I kind of had to deal with during my time at Amazon Kids was localization. Once again, something we I, I kind of take I take for granted, you know, when I'm watching Netflix or any of the streaming services, you know, I watch it in English, so it, it's available. Or if I watch, you know, uh, Japanese anime, then I realize the intricacies of, you know, even a specific word going from Japanese to, to English. So when I was at Amazon Kids, you know, we were thinking about uh, you know, how we're going to launch in Latin America, and, and then it got down to very specifics, like what tone of the Spanish and, you know, what voice actor are we going to hire to, to do this? So can you talk about the high level, maybe a couple of categories of Spanish that can be used for localization? And, and what do you recommend for if you, you know, de depending on limited budgets or whatnot, if you can only pick like one or two to represent all of Latin America, you know, the, the 20 or so Spanish speaking countries, which one would you pick? Okay, so that's that's something that it's relevant for everything that it, you know happens in entertainment, toys, movies, uh, video games. I think right now we consider in Latin America neutral Spanish. Neutral Spanish for us would be Mexican and Colombian Spanish, right? So pretty much all the dubbing for the different entertainment categories, it would be done by those by those kind of Spanish. The thing that you would never do if you're uh, entering the Latin American market is come up with Spanish from Spain, let's say, right? Because that would be like, that's a bus killer for all of our users, consumers, you know, like they really don't understand. It's very different. If you ask the, the, the Brazilian market, they feel the same with the Portuguese from Portugal. So you wouldn't do that either. It's very different. We try to like, if you really want to have success in the region, that's the best advice we could give them, right? Pretty much everything that's been launched, let's say uh, movies that are, have been very successful in the region, like Pixar movies or DreamWorks, I don't know if I can say uh, <laughs> the names, but even games, right? That uh, we had to dub like Halo and we started dubbing in Microsoft and, and Bandai Namco, um, Senseiya and other games. Uh, everything was done here in Mexico, right? And it was, like it was very successful all throughout Latin America, even to the Patagonia, right, in Argentina. So they are, everyone in, in the region is well uh, acquainted to the Mexican and the Colombian Spanish in the entertainment uh, world. Got it. I actually want to ask about Mexico because it is, the you know, to most Americans, it's the closest country and there's a lot of just like stereotypes and uh, good, good and bad. And um, I don't think a lot of understanding because I think most Americans don't even get a chance to visit Mexico besides maybe, you know, if you're in uh, the West Coast, you just drive down, it's really close to, to Tijuana or you're flying to the popular, you know, beach or vacation destinations like, you know, Cancun or, or Cabo. 
but um, but it was very interesting what you just said about uh, just even in you know Latin America, like Mexico seems to be exporting uh, a lot of culture. So uh, and, and I totally understand that. You know, you said thirty three countries. Not every country is going to have the infrastructure to do everything. Do you like you know what are the top two countries in Latin America that are creating a lot of content? Or, 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 you know, kind of leading certain, like, you know, like the arts and entertainment that other people are consuming? Wow, that's, that's a tough one, I think. Right now, that has been growing. It's been diversifying. Uh, I think right now, if you see, I don't know, like Amazon, like, let's say Prime Video or Netflix, even a lot of the original content that they're producing is out of Mexico, but also out of uh I don't know, like, let's say Colombia and Mexico would be the top countries that are doing in the in the movie or series, TV series uh, business. We have some Argentinians on the obviously on the on the Portuguese side, Brazil is, is 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 doing great. When it comes to to the video game industry, I think the talent comes from uh, pretty much Mexico. And then uh, let's say, I don't know, like 70 or even 80 percent. And then it's kind of like Colombia. But I think it's growing. I think a lot of different countries are having a little bit more visibility in the original content that it's been um, imported or or exported, sorry. But I think the Mexican content is the, if we had to put kind of like percentages, would be for all the Spanish speaking uh, countries in Latin, those 20 countries that I mentioned, would be, I think, Mexico with around, I don't know, maybe 70%. And let's put Colombia around, I don't know, like 20%. And the remaining would be like all the other countries, right? So yes, I think Mexico is between 70 to 80%, you know, that's expo- that's, exporting content. That's in- very interesting. Because I think, you know, if you're just like a typical American, you probably don't analyze or even think about these topics. Okay, another question about Mexico uh, is, or actually about Mexico and maybe like Miami is let's say you are uh, a new entertainment brand and you want to open up an office. Let's say you're an American company or like a global company. There's so much positive noise coming out from Miami. And I guess one question I've always had was if you wanted to build a Latin American team, you know, what are the pros and cons of like actually having, let's say, an office in Latin America, whether it's Mexico or Colombia versus like Miami? How, how would a company think about it? And how would, let's say, let's say you as uh, the, the leader of that team, how would you think about it? Because let's say you can live in Miami or Mexico City or in, in Colombia, whatever, you have all the choices. What will you be thinking about as the company and as like the leader of this team? I mean, Miami has always been known as, as kind of like the headquarter for LATAM in the US, right? I think from a while. Uh, I think they speak more Spanish than English. Whenever I come down, it's like a lot of people speaking Spanish, right? But um, the, the thing is that I wouldn't just uh, point it out in North America to be Miami. I think it has expanded to, let's say, California, LA, uh, and even San Francisco could be a good, um, a good place to open if you want to be North American based. The good thing is that if you want to have local, obviously the local flavor, local agencies, people working with the brands here and with the different consumers, retailers, anything like that, uh, the best thing to do is to open kind of like a a Latin American uh, office, right? Maybe your, your headquarters could be in the other regions. Right now, I think most companies are already, you know, um, setting themselves in the region, whether it's Mexico City, whether it's even Brazil, you know, if they want to cover the whole region, it doesn't matter. A lot of headquarters are being based out of Brazil, like regional uh, headquarters, even Argentina, right? Let's say I remember Nickelodeon being there, uh, MTV at some point, but most of the companies are based out of Mexico City, like the big companies, let's say Snap, you know, the base is here, Amazon, it's here. Uh, Let's say we're going to be talking about manga, Microsoft, Apple, uh, uh, Netflix, Google, everyone, like the big, big uh, office is based out of Mexico. They might have some other sales points or oh, in Argentina and other places, but mainly it's Mexico or Brazil. That would be the top countries where you would open your operations. Let's talk a little bit about video game business in Latin America. So uh, once again, I'm not an expert, but you know, what are some of the 
top games or genres of games that are doing well in Latin America? I know it's kind of a broad question, but I'll give you an example. I remember when I was younger, like in the 90s, CSGO was very popular. And for some reason, Brazil is huge into CSGO. Like, it's just like a big, like everyone just knows it. Like Brazilian just, Brazilian players represent a large player base of, of, of Counter-Strike. Are there any other like games or, 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 you know, genres where, you know, Latin American players, you can include all the countries, are known to be kind of like more active in? Or, or is there some like funny thing, you know, like that, that they're involved in that, you know, you want to share? Sure. I mean, that's a great question. Because as you mentioned, Brazil is really good at Counter-Strike. And let's say, for example, when it comes to Riot Games, Valorant, you know, like we thought it was going to be very successful in, in, you know, pretty much everywhere. But the main place that has been very surprising for, I think, the company was uh, Valorant doing great in in Brazil as well. I don't know, it's a fun fact, but it's very curious that Dota 2, for example, it's very, very, uh, I think it's the most important game in Peru. Uh, Peru like really rocks at Dota 2, like the top players of Dota 2 in LATAM, even, you know, like uh, being part of, of World Cups and, and tournaments is it, they're based out of like Peru, right? Probably Russians and Peruvians are the best Dota 2 players. Call of Duty could be a little bit more like uh, Mexico and Brazil too. Uh, Argentina is also, you know, really heavy on, on, on really good shooters let's say PUBG and Battle Royale mainly, right? Uh, Fortnite, same as Mexico. Uh, I think we're big at Fortnite, Free Fire. Well, Free Fire is kind of like a case that it's, it's doing well everywhere, right? Also social games such as Among Us and Fall Guys at the moment, like we're huge in the whole region. But I think one of the main, the main genres performing well in LATAM are shooters. Right now, specifically uh, when it comes to uh, the viral Rojong, if we consider it also a genre, sports games, right? Obviously, you know that we're big on football. So uh, when it comes to FIFA, that it's the only one that really, really performs, you know, above and beyond. Uh, also, I mean, NFL, other ga- sports games, they perform well. But I mean, when it comes to 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 get sports games, FIFA is that it's kind of like the 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 cherry on the cake. I think for RPGs, I mean, there are games that also perform really well here. You would be surprised a lot of like uh, Japanese games perform really well here. Remember that the first games that were launched in, in the region, I mean, we were open to, to, to Japan very easily. So the franchises such as Dragon Ball, Naruto, uh, Sega games, Sonic games, Nintendo are well loved by the region, right? Because those have been in, 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 in the region since, I don't know, like 90s, right? Uh, or even, I don't know, if, 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 if earlier than that. So those brands are really close to a lot of hearts. And even though these games have been, or franchises have been transitioning to the new generation, you know, tweaking here and there, uh, they're still very relevant. So let's say anime, it's a big, big genre in the region. Uh, that's something that would be a little surprising for you, but we are big on anime. I think those are the main genres that I would consider. RPGs is, is, is important, but shooters, anime, and sport game, sports games would be the top thing. And Minecraft is a, it's a, a, another success, uh, and I think it was a surprise for Microsoft when they launched it in the region. But also something worth mentioning is remember that we're a very mobile driven region now. So before consoles were a thing, but not everyone could afford the console. And now that mobile games are a thing, we are, I think, after APAC, the second biggest region when it comes to mobile games uh, consumption, because it's something that it's affordable. Everyone has a cell phone and in these, these times of pandemic, even more so, right? Because you needed to take your classes through Zoom. So the, the phone was the main device for every person, you know, student, uh, people that are working and couldn't afford a, a, a computer. So mobile games are, are impressive. And a, a good fact that I can add about that is if you compare Android to Apple in the region, it would be 95% Android, 5% Apple EOS, right? So that's how this is like the operational systems work also here besides other regions. That's super interesting because 
I thought of another like stat I remember in the past. I think like the largest importer or you know the biggest manga market outside of Japan was something like Germany or France. It just you, you I wouldn't expect that, but it's just so cool that you know the broader like entertainment can really be consumed by anyone anywhere, and, and you can't just assume you know certain people will like it or not. So actually on that topic, I know that generally speaking, as it comes to like video games and anime, you know, that type of entertainment, uh, interactive entertainment. The United States has been a big exporter and creator of, of this type of content. And so has, let's say, Japan. What are some like Latin American grown uh, entertainment brands that people might not know of? Or, or maybe they're huge in Latin America, but people just haven't seen it because it's not, you know, really distributed outside. So is there any like any big you know, it could, it could also be like uh, content type. Like you, you've been telling me about like telenovelas, but you know, I'm not into that, but that's, you know, people know that, you know, Latin America is known for that type of content. So what types of content or maybe a specific piece of content uh, is like broadly Latin America known for? Well, that you, you nail it. I think telenovelas was the first entertainment content that was exported out of uh, of our region, even into places like, Romania and uh, Russia and uh, Central Eastern Europe, right? Like we would never imagine, or Asia. And people knowing about, you know, the telenovelas that we watch, like, you know, uh, as a population in Latin every day. So I think that would be the, the biggest exported content from our region, to be honest. There are some, like, obviously growing companies uh, when it comes to entertainment in video games, even. I think uh, the countries that have you know, really grown in that area or have been creating a lot of video game companies would be Brazil and, and Argentina. We have Ethermax, you know, doing a trivia crack and that company has been performing really well. We have Walt Studios doing really important games right now, uh, like 3D, 3D Sniper. Uh, also, we have Tab Games in Brazil They're doing a lot of different kind of like puzzle games, but let's say they have more than I don't know, like maybe 200 uh, games out there, right? There are a lot of like small companies too that, you know, like launching mobile games that are becoming a thing that are well consumed all over the world. I mean, globalization is, is also, you know, part of it. And right now the regionals, right, that are happening in, in the different streaming platform, you know, Amazon launching their own originals, Netflix launching, Netflix launching their own originals, even Apple doing now originals. So I think that also has been helpful to export the content that it's been done here. And this is kind of like going on, right? I, I, I won't lie that we don't have the impact as Japan Japan's content or like, you know, those big companies that we know Nintendo, Sega, you know, coming to, to like worldwide and, and really, really, you know, uh, growing on us. And even the American content, right? Same thing even including European, European content, I think Ubisoft has been like really one of the best video game companies right now uh, with all the different cases, you know, Microsoft buying Activision Blizzard mm -hmm. and blah, blah, blah. Ubisoft, I think, has been one of the strongest companies and the, and, and the content has been well consumed in the region, even creating uh, esports uh, teams and nailing it in tournaments, right? So I think right now, the Latin American content, probably we are at a very intermediate stage if we, yeah. if we want to put it no i think um i i'm actually like you know i wish there were easy ways to like invest because you know the countries that are more established in entertainment it's very expensive to do something there now so the best example i can think of is south korea you know a relatively small country but like a neck a net exporter of entertainment and culture and, and that didn't start from scratch. They've been investing in it a lot. I, I'm not sure if the government's involved, but, uh, you, you know, even in, in terms of like regu uh, video games, you know, it's kind of like regulated at the PC bongs. So uh, generally speaking, I think talent is global. It's everywhere. You know, I think it's easy to like crap on the the, the big tech firms. But I, I what I like, one good outcome of them is that to seek more talent because there's so much competition and it's too expensive to only be in like, you know, the U.S. market or like Europe. They're expanding everywhere. And um, I think that's going to be a good opportunity to find like, quote unquote, local talent 
And frankly, it's going to be just produced at a fraction of the cost. So that's good for the company, I guess. Uh, but ultimately, I guess, it, you know, the costs are passed down to the, the customers as well. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think also, I mean, I'm missing this part, but in the movie industry, I think we've done, uh, it was, there was a milestone for us with, with certain directors like Guillermo del Toro, Alejandro González Iñárritu, Cuaron, right? Already, you know, winning Oscars, cinematographers like Emmanuel Lubezki. You know, that talent has been, I mean, they started here, right? They started doing movies here with local budget and not the best budget probably. And now they're doing uh, movies all over the world with the best budget, you know, investing in different actors. They can probably choose from wherever they want and bring the actor, you know, actors from, from you know, English actors, whatever actor they want to bring into, the, into their movie. It's kind of like a wish come true, right? So that's kind of like some of the talent that, that we've been able to export, but also it has kind of like created uh, universal uh, movies, right? Because they include talent from all over the world, right? The director is, it's Mexican and maybe the cinematographer too, but then, you know, the producer is, I don't know, from other region, the actors are from different places. So then it becomes kind of like a, a, a Babel Tower or a, or a universal uh, movie, if you want to put it that way, right? Uh, but yes, I think there's a lot of great talent in, in the in the Latin American region, even including music. I think we haven't uh, touched the, the music part of entertainment, you know, like music artists, you know, doing great worldwide, like Shakira, for example. We have Maluma, you know, reggaeton has been a thing. It's a, it, it, it's a very Latin American uh, genre and it has been pretty much all over the world. Uh, we have J Balvin, Bad Bunny. All these reggaeton artists have really, really done something, you know, huge, not only reggaeton, but also pop music and, and some other like Latin American genres of music like uh, salsa or uh, cumbia, you know, Selena back in the day, even when, when we were not in this uh, globalized world, she was, she was amazing. Elton John just did kind of like a, a tribute to her in Texas. So there's a, a lot of different kind of like thing going on when it comes to the different entertainment categories, right? Totally. Final question, uh, which is also related to the video game market, which is about, you know, video game creators. So uh, I don't have the stat in front of me, but I was doing some research on this topic. And both in 2020 and in 2021, a large percentage of the top concurrent streams and just the overall kind of like you know hours watched for for creators are spanish speaking and when i mean that i just mean they only stream in spanish that seems like wild to me like no one's really talking about that and that's just like huge i'm talking about like 40 50 percent i'm gonna go find the stats later but like why is that like that's a that's a big you know it, it has to be driven by you know latin america right because the population of Spain is, is, is only a fraction of that. Well, I think it's a mix of everything, right? I mean, I think uh, some of the top creators, Spanish-speaking creators, uh, let's say the Rubius and Ibai and uh, Vegeta, Willy Rex, you know, they're based out of Spain, but probably, like, not probably, I can probably assure it that most of their content is well consumed in Latin America, right? The, the, the key driver, the consumers are here and in North America. Remember, there are around 60 million people uh, in the U.S. speak Spanish, right? There are Spanish speakers. And that's something that obviously um, help us, you know, in that area. A lot of our Spanish speaking creators, they, their content is consumed in these, you know, Latin American countries. So we're talking 20 Spanish speaking countries in Latam, plus Spain, plus the U.S., plus Canada, right? And, and other countries that, you know, they, they have Spanish speaker around the world, right? So I think if we're talking about creator, uh, creators and content, I, uh, sometimes it's good not only to see it as a region, but also as a language, right? Spanish is, I think, one of the top language when it comes to content creation worldwide. Uh, if we would put the statistics, not only in video game content, but also in entertainment content, sports, all that stuff, and add it up, we would probably be... Uh, number one when it comes to content, you know, exported all over the world. I think second would be obviously English. Between English and Spanish could be really, you know, adding it up would be 
very similar. And then Arabic, I think it's another one that could come up into the list. And well, Chinese content, right? I wouldn't, uh, uh, there are, uh, I don't know, like 3.4 billion people yeah. or something like that, you know, uh, that speak Chinese in the world. But yeah, Spanish, I think it's kind of like a, a something that most of the entertainment companies probably are exploring or they should be exploring because it's very relevant. I would say right now, if we are talking gaming content uh, in the US, I think the Spanish speaking content that is consuming the US could be around, I don't know, maybe adding it up, like all streaming platforms all, all, all over, it would be probably around, I don't know, maybe 40%. That, you know, I think younger audiences, by the way, I, I think it's, it's that and I, I feel I, I, like people kind of know this, but they don't know this, right? Like, I, I know when I was growing up in New York City, we had to learn Spanish for a couple a couple of uh, years in, in, in high school, just because we have a big Spanish population or Spanish speaking population in, in New York City, California, where, where I'm from right now, or I'm in right now is the same is in the same boat. So, and that's really interesting if you're working in an international business, because, you know, I think the thinking of like launching like per country only makes sense when you need like a physical location, like uh, maybe for physical commerce or things like that. But if you're just doing entertainment, uh, you know, thinking about language, languages, uh, you're going to get a lot more scalability, especially because you can make the content in, you know, one or multiple countries, depending on where you're, you know, talent and editing is uh but ultimately you could kind of export it it's just you know through the internet so it doesn't really matter so that's a great fun fact for uh business nerds yeah so those are all the questions i had any other like final thoughts you want to share about latin america video games entertainment well i hope that it keeps growing i hope that um i think uh the latin american region has a lot of to give a lot of talent out there that needs investment, right? Uh, a lot of companies that could really do really great games. Uh, that's why sometimes these companies get bought, right? They just build their own games and so on. And then they get attracted by holdings or bigger companies and then they get absorbed, right? Which is normal in, in this industry. And it's normal probably in a lot of different industries, but it would be interesting to understand what is the potential about, you know, companies creating video games in LATAM if we would have kind of like the investment that other regions might have. That, that is something that always, you know, I always think about it, but it's something that probably, you know, over the years we will see a, more growth, right? We have some unicorns here with, in, in other sectors, fintechs, uh, delivery apps like Rappi. Rappi is one of our top unicorns that has become a great successful company, you know, uh, not just in Latin America, but, you know, it's kind of like going all over. There are other companies doing the same. I hope that in the video game industry, we can see some unicorns too coming out from LATAM. Uh, I think it's just a matter of some, some years and, and money <laughs> that that's important to, men to mention too. That's it. I think uh, we have great talent here and great creators let's see what happens with now the arbr part of uh, of the video game uh industry it's going to be very interesting there's a lot of there are already latin developers out there and creators uh performing in the different uh platforms if we put it this name uh, this way but i'm excited I'm, I'm excited about the video game industry and and everything that's coming up i think it's going to be impactful like when the internet was launched, kind of like yeah. the same thing. Nice. Um, so looking forward. What about no. you, John? No, no, likewise. I, you know, I feel like one of the best moves I've done in my career is to just go into gaming. You know, I mean, if the industry is doing well, you have more opportunities, obviously. And, and it's just more fun. You know, I, I was going to do something. I was going to continue in consulting or like finance. And I think those jobs are great for people who want to do it as well. But I think pivoting to, to, to video games has just, uh, you know, made me happy. And it's just fun, right? Like, just to be working in any entertainment field is really kind of like a blessing. It's definitely hard because a lot of people want to do it too. But uh, I think it's definitely, um, you yeah, know, it's, it's been good for me. And it looks like it's been good for you too. So Yeah, it has been. <laughs> yeah. And also, I think if you love finance, I mean, blockchain and games that are happening right now. Oh, my God. Yeah, that's another. Mixing gaming and, and, and finance is going to be, I mean, I'm trying to, to learn a little bit more about them. 
I mean, they're becoming a thing, right? So yeah, yeah. it's it, it's something that I, I think we should be exploring and maybe next time we, we, we can talk about it and become experts on blockchain in games. But I'm interested to understand that part of like finance and gaming and, mo oh. and more from your point of view that you have to those two backgrounds. Totally. Well, uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us today and uh, take care. Thank you so much for having me, John, and have a, an amazing day.